here <clears throat> and has been off uh, treatment completely for several years at this point, who awoke on April 25th with a uh, bilateral headache that she described as vertex, at times occipital or frontal. Her headache was described as more of a pressure-like uh, tightening of her head. It was non-throbbing. She had no uh, photophobia, phonophobia, or nausea. She had no visual symptoms. Uh, there was no jaw claudication. She had no systemic uh, symptoms to make us think uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. Uh, before she was seen in our clinic, uh, she'd seen several providers. She'd had bilateral uh, greater occipital nerve blocks on May 17th with minimal improvement. She'd been given low-dose gabapentin. Uh, she was on topiramate for only three days uh, at an ineffective dose, and she'd been given tizanidine two milligrams at bedtime uh, for several days with no improvement. She was seen by ophthalmology. Uh, she has a, a chronic mild ophthalmologic problem and saw her regular ophthalmologist on May 7th who felt that there was a low suspicion for uh, a giant cell arteritis. Uh, her primary care doctor, after uh, doing a lab test on the 6th of May, put her on prednisone. It's not entirely clear in the medical record if she was on this for three days or uh, four days, but she received at least three or four days of prednisone, 60 milligrams a day, with no change at all in her symptoms. Uh, she subsequently had an MRI scan of her brain with and without contrast that was unremarkable and a temporal arteritis uh, or GCA scan, ultrasound of the cranial arteries, and this included the temporalis, the facial artery, and occipital artery uh, that was negative for any signs of temporal arteritis. She had uh, a lab testing a number of times. Uh, she had a sedimentation rate done. Uh, uh, normal for uh, women is often considered less than 30, although uh, frequently, uh, uh, age plus 10 divided by 2 is used as the normal for women over the age of 65. She had a sedimentation rate in an outside lab that was 55 on the 6th of May. Uh, she subsequently had sedimentation rates obtained on the 7th of May, the 16th of June, and the 19th of June, which you can see here. She only had a single CRP done on uh, May 7th that was 5.2, which is markedly elevated. Uh, in particular, she does not have diabetes or uh, renal failure and is not known to have had any sort of an autoimmune disease. To, so the reason for the elevated CRP was not entirely clear. Uh, we saw her in uh, May. Uh, our clinic actually ordered the uh, uh, ultrasound study. And uh, about two weeks after she saw us, she had an abrupt change in her pain with the development of severe stabbing left-sided paraorbital pain and blurred vision. She had an ophthalmology evaluation on the 17th and was noted to have a small peripheral field defect in the left eye, was admitted on the 17th, was given uh, three days of IV steroids and had a biopsy on the 17th or 18th of June that was um, strongly positive for giant cell arteritis. She received a total of three days of methylprednisolone that was transitioned to 60 milligrams a day of prednisone as an outpatient and uh, is supposed to be starting uh, tocilizumab uh, in July. Her headache resolved within a few days of her admission. Um, she was seen by ophthalmology on the, by neuro-ophthalmology on June 25th and still had the visual field defect. This was thought to be somewhat improved. Um, and she still had a, a afferent pupillary defect of the left eye. Um, so this uh, case of temporal arteritis was uh, somewhat puzzling and I'm gonna walk us few, through a few uh, slides to kind of talk about uh, you know, what was going on here and uh, try and make sense of this. Um, the incidence of uh, temporal arteritis in the general population is uh, frequently quoted as somewhere between 10 and 25 per 100,000 in the uh, age over 50 group. Um, the most recent uh, uh, data is from uh, 2021 uh, and gave a rate of 25 per 100,000. People with temporal arteritis typically have generalized symptoms that include weight loss, fatigue, anorexia, and malaise. What's particularly interesting in this patient is these symptoms weren't apparent until after she'd been formally diagnosed, uh, and she uh, noted these at her follow-up visit on June 25th. 75% of people have a headache, but that means 25% of people don't have a headache. 
and patients can present with purely visual symptoms. And uh, this can include uh, what we would think of as uh, amaurosis fugax as the only symptom. 90% uh, of people have a sedimentation rate over the age of 50. I mean, over the age of, over the level of 50 millimeters per hour. Uh, but 10% of patients have a sedimentation rate less than 50. A sedimentation rate is not a new test. It was first described in 1897. And the standard way in which this was done uh, was uh, formalized about 1921 uh, by Westgren. Um, uh, CRP is a more recent test. It's usually elevated, but there are a number of case reports of people that have a normal sedimentation rate and biopsy proven uh, temporal arteritis. The American College of Rheumatology criteria are relatively old. Uh, uh, there's only five uh, items, age over 50, new onset headache, temporal artery abnormalities on exam that include things like tenderness, uh, uh, swelling of the temporal artery, absent pulses, and a sedimentation rate that's greater or equal to 50 millimeters an hour, as well as an abnormal biopsy. Temporal artery biopsy itself is uh, reasonably sensitive and very specific. Uh, there's a lot of debate in the literature regarding how this should be performed, whether or not it should be bilateral at a single time. Uh, there are uh, clear indications that the length of the segment taken doing a biopsy is kind of critical to improving your sensitivity and specificity. Uh, there's been a lot of work done over the last uh, five to 10 years on uh, cranial artery ultrasound, looking for a halo sign. And when compared to biopsy, uh, temporal artery ultrasound approaches the sensitivity of biopsy and might be slightly less specific. Um, MRI scan uh, also can detect temporal arteritis, uh, generally you need to uh, indicate uh, when you order this that you're specifically looking for temporal arteritis so that they both obtain the right images and attend to the smaller arteries that they don't normally comment on. It appears to be somewhat less specific than the biopsy itself. More recently, there's been uh, a number of publications suggesting that uh, PET-CT scan is quite sensitive, even though it's not as specific and diagnosing uh, temporal arteritis. Uh, obviously, the problem with PET-CT scan is that it takes a little bit of lead time to uh, uh, arrange the uh, nuclear medicine ligand, as well as uh, it being significantly more expensive than ultrasound or temporal artery biopsy. Uh, treatment, um, one of the challenges with diagnosing uh, this is that the uh, treatment can be particularly problematic. Uh, a significant percentage of our uh, patients where this is a possible diagnosis have diabetes, uh, which complicates the treatment with prednisone. Uh, oral prednisone at 60 milligrams a day with a very prolonged taper has been the standard treatment up until recently. Tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 uh, uh, blocker, was FDA approved in 2017 for the treatment of uh, temporal arteritis. Uh, there are then two uh, really uh, reasonably well done randomized uh, controlled trials showing that uh, starting patients on prednisone and tocilizumab uh, uh, with a rapid taper after 12 to 24 weeks of the steroid results in significantly better steroid free remission rates than patients that are on steroids only. And at one year, more than 50% of people treated with tocilizumab are remission-free and off steroids. So it uh, appears to be a better treatment. Uh, this particular patient uh, uh, is uh, awaiting uh, insurance authorization, which they anticipate is going to happen sometime in the next week or two to get started out with tocilizumab. Um, so uh, in summary, this is a, a, an interesting case that presented with no real symptoms that would match what's typically talked about with uh, temporal arteritis. Uh, but when she had an abrupt change in her symptoms, including visual symptoms, was rapidly uh, treated appropriately in biopsy. When we've needed uh, quick biopsies of the temporal artery uh, from the headache clinic, we've either paged neuro-ophthalmology on call or paged the ENT resident on call. Um, uh, a number of years ago, when we only had one neuro-ophthalmologist, uh, 
uh, ENT was uh, easily accessible to do these biopsies and out, as an outpatient uh, local anesthetic type procedure. So that's another uh, source for you on this. Um, any questions or comments real quickly about this? All right, Tim. I'll take the screen over from you for a second. Thank you. All right. Uh, today is the Headache Division's uh, Grand Rounds, and Tim and Sveta are going to uh, talk to us. But I just wanted to reflect a minute on just how much growth there's been in, in the Headache Division over the last five years. I think five years ago, we were down to Tim, and maybe Hillary was with us then. Uh, but I just, I just went on the division site, and there's Tim. Unfortunately, Wolfgang is no more, but uh, just, just look at how many providers there are now. And that doesn't even include the two PhD scientists who are taking up for uh, Wolfgang Yang Chen and Carlene Moore. So, um, uh, you know, that's a tribute to Tim and now a tribute to Sveta, who is the uh, director of the Headache Fellowship, which is, you know, filling with fellows every year, I mean, it was very, very robust. And uh, we're so proud of everyone in the headache division and uh, the leadership of that division. So Tim, I'll, I'll turn the screen back to you and Sveta. Thanks, Rich. So I'm going to uh, lead off. Um, uh, let me find my talk here, just a minute. All right, so uh, everyone should be able to see my slide. Uh, our topic this morning is migraine and functional neurologic disorders, which uh, were migraine and conversion disorder. And I'm gonna start by kind of giving an overview of uh, uh, functional disorders and their relationship to migraine headache. And then Dr. Sengupta is going to uh, present some uh, preliminary data from an uh, ongoing uh, research project that we uh, started up uh, about uh, six or seven months ago on this particular topic. So uh, functional neurologic disorders or conversion disorders or hysteria has been a topic that's been written about uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, uh, Dr. Brody, who was the surgeon to uh, Queen Victoria wrote that uh, this is not that the muscles are incapable of volition, but that the functional volition is not exercised, indicating that very early on it was understood that this was due to a volitional problem or a, a difficulty in uh, uh, the brain's function of telling the muscles to work rather than a stroke or other uh, uh, structural disease. Um, the name hysteria was used throughout the 1800s. It was actually used up until uh, the late 20th century, meaning the 1970s and 80s. Uh, Freud wrote a lot about this. Uh, he's actual, actually the person responsible of moving the idea of, of functional symptoms from neurology over to psychiatry. And he invented this psychodynamic process that he uh, uh, described that some sort of intolerable feelings or emotions were converted uh, by the subconscious into physical symptoms. Um, this appeared to explain the symptoms, but uh, you know, over the last 50 years, Freud's theories have been uh, kind of abandoned. It took a lot of more time in the US than in the UK, which uh, the UK had never really uh, kind of bought into that. Uh, his theories on how the psychodynamic process in our mind worked became increasingly complicated during his uh, uh, career of writing and uh, really uh, had no data at all to support what he was talking about. The name hysteria was abandoned, but the conversion disorder name that we've often used in neurology 
uh, up until very recently was uh, continued. And that idea of conversion disorder is based entirely on uh, Freud's writings. Um, more recently, in the last uh, uh, 10 or 20 years, there's been uh, a move to call these functional neurologic symptoms rather than conversion disorder, uh, which uh, from the standpoint of a, a functional problem uh, is easier to talk with patients about rather than pulling out something like conversion disorder or hysteria that, that uh, really uh, gets them agitated. Um, so uh, from the standpoint of uh, functional weakness, uh, this has been described uh, a, a lot over the last 200 years. Todd's described, Todd's who uh, uh, first described paralysis after seizure, uh, wrote about this as well. Paul Burkrett uh, in 1859 uh, was one of the first people to do a systematic study of, of functional weakness and noted uh, in his patients, this appeared to be somewhat more frequent on the left than the right side. Uh, Sir James Paget uh, uh, also described functional weakness and described this as an unwilling imitation of organic disease, which is interesting even then that there was this idea that there was some sort of mimicry of an actual structural disease. And as we'll see that uh, plays out uh, uh, moving forward. Charcot of course wrote a lot on hysteria and functional weakness. Um, his protege, uh, Pierre Genet, uh, also wrote a lot on uh, functional weakness and uh, was pointing towards both cognitive and psychological issues as uh, important um, uh, in this. He is also one of the first people to describe uh, how many patients with functional symptoms had a, a relatively minor injury that appeared to precipitate very dramatic symptoms. Uh, William Gowers uh, was one of the first people to describe giveaway weakness as the legs of a typical symptom and functional weakness uh, in the presence of normal physiology. In World War I, there was a lot more, uh, following World War I, I should say, there was a lot more written and debated about hysteria uh, and shell shock. And this is when the psychodynamic model uh, was really uh, became influential, especially here in the US. And between roughly the world wars and uh, 19, the 1990s, uh, this was really pretty firmly in the uh, psychology side of things from a treatment. And while neurologists would recognize that this was functional, there was really not much discussed on the neurology side of uh, what do we do about this or where do we take it? And it hasn't been really until the last 25 years or so that there's been a significant uptick in the uh, publications regarding this. So how often does this really occur? Well, the study in the UK in 2010, uh, which was really looking at the incidence of functional symptoms and all patients referred to a uh, tertiary care center uh, found that about 15% of their patients had a functional or psychologic diagnosis as, as an explanation for their symptoms. There are other smaller studies that have suggested the incidence of this is between 1 and 18%. And one study looking specifically at patients after back surgery found 3% of those patients had functional symptoms. All of these studies, the authors uh, discuss these symptoms. Uh, and suggest that their uh, incidence that they're seeing is likely an underestimated the actual incidence of functional symptoms. Um, interestingly, the age of onset of functional neurologic symptoms is typically in the mid 30s or a bit older. Um, this is a variant compared to non-epileptic seizures, which often start in the 20s. In an outpatient uh, consecutive uh, series of patients evaluated at a, a secondary institution uh, in Europe, about 60 to 80 percent of the patients were women. There's been some smaller case series that suggest that there may be a more 50-50 split. And some of that uh, appears to be based on how many 
military cases are included in the case series uh, because if you look at military populations, it's more men than women, so there might be a higher incidence in that population given the stresses they go through. Um, on an examination or on presentation in the clinic, unilateral or single extremity weakness is the most common symptom. Bilateral leg weakness is much more common in back pain patients. And as was noted in the 1800s, there's a slight bias for left-sided weakness compared to right-sided weakness. About half the patients in case series appear to present with abrupt onset of stroke-like symptoms. Um, and triggers that have been discussed uh, in the past by other authors, including minor injury, or migraine headaches, or non-epileptic symptoms appear to be uh, uh, common triggers. Dissociative symptoms as a trigger or a coexisting symptom are fairly common in these patients. And uh, screening for dissociative symptoms may be helpful in evaluating uh, these types of symptoms. A physical injury, relatively minor injuries, are uh, present in uh, a significant number of patients. Um, complex regional pain syndrome is uh, may be associated with minor uh, uh, injuries and may be more common in people with functional symptoms. There's recently been a couple of papers debating whether or not CRPS is a functional or structural uh, problem. Um, and that's uh, uh, kind of outside of the scope of what we're going to talk about today. Patients with functional symptoms have multiple other symptoms. They frequently have uh, sleep disturbances. They often have memory complaints. Um, uh, these types of complaints occur in about 40% of patients with functional symptoms and only 9% of uh, non-effective controls. So there's a number of maneuvers that we perform during the neurologic examination that uh, are indicative of uh, functional weakness or functional symptoms or uh, volitional problems. Uh, there's a number of these th tests uh, that we do that have had pretty decent systematic uh, validation trials where they look at both uh, reliability of the test and inter rate her reliability, whether or not exam by multiple other examiners finds similar things. Hoover's sign, I think most of us are familiar with. Drift without pronation is uh, one that has a really uh, pretty decent uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity. Giveaway weakness, which is initial effort followed by uh, poor effort is uh, one of the uh, fairly common uh, indicators. Inconsistencies in use is not something that is discussed a lot in uh, the clinic, but it's really an important thing that we notice in the headache clinic in terms of patients reporting that their hand is weak and then we observe them uh, carrying their purse or manipulating their cell phone or using their weak arm to assist them to sit up onto the exam table that tells us that they're weak at some times and strong at others. Collapsing weakness, on the other hand, is really dramatic. This is when someone appears to give good effort and all of a sudden just either collapses to the ground or just stops making any effort at all and appears to be paralyzed. Splitting the midline, this is one that we use quite a bit uh, in the neuro exam. Um, as we know, uh, pinprick and light touch don't uh, change abruptly at the midline because of the overlap of the nerve fibers from one side to the other. Uh, vibration, um, the, the inconsistencies of this are the fact that when you have the tuning fork on one single bone, it, sh it should feel the same everywhere. And so uh, we often do this on the forehead from one side to the other, or uh, just tilting the tuning fork one direction or the other to try and see if they report a difference. This can also be done on the sternum using different places on the sternum because it's one solid bone, the vibration sensation is going to be the same everywhere else. Non-anatomic sensory loss is a little more difficult, requires a more difficult, uh, more complicated exam. Um, the chair test is really interesting. I, I learned about this uh, a number of years ago. Um, this is a test that's specifically for people with a functional gait disorder. Uh, if you put them in a rolling office chair and have them walk the chair up and down the hallway using just their legs forward and backwards, 
If they can do that normally with their legs, but they can't walk right, that's highly suggestive that they have a functional gait disorder. There's a couple of really decent papers on that. Um, Charcot actually described the dragging of a monoplegic leg. This is where someone has a leg that's paralyzed and they drag it behind them like it's a board. Um, and there's actually some early photographs from the late 1800s of, of this exact uh, maneuver. Uh, knee buckling without a fall. Um, this is really common in back pain as well as uh, some other patients with functional symptoms. This is where they kind of bob up and down while they're standing in place uh, with their knees buckling, but then they straighten back up and they don't actually fall. And that's another uh, real good functional symptom to observe uh, when we're examining patients. So the pitfalls of diagnosing structural, uh, or diagnosing functional disorders is that patients may have comorbid structural neurologic disease. So in the same situation that we see in epilepsy patients who also have non-epileptic seizures, we can see patients with actual structural disease, uh, whether it's a stroke or a multiple sclerosis, who then on top of that have functional symptoms, and that can be very difficult to sort out at times. At least in our clinic, what we're more likely to see is people with uh, both a uh, cervical or thoracic, um, cervical or lumbar radiculopathy with superimposed uh, predominantly functional weakness that doesn't fit with their supposed lesion. Um, the other thing that's uh, difficult with this is patients with pain, especially fibromyalgia patients, often give very poor effort when we try to examine them. So poor effort by itself doesn't indicate a functional symptom. Um, and then patients with frontal lobe disorders that have neglect uh, can also really be difficult to examine from the standpoint of functional symptoms. So conversion and migraine headache as cause existing disease has really not been described a whole lot. Um, Babinski described in 1890 four patients with migraine and aura and conversion symptoms that occurred only during the headache. And he referred to, to this as migraine ophthalmic hysterique. Um, so there was a second paper that described this uh, uh, coexistence in 1948 um, that was published in uh, uh, a Spanish medical journal and I've not been able to find an actual copy of this to review. The next time this was discussed was in 2010 where a group in uh, Spain at the University Hospital uh, in Madrid, um, and this paper fortunately is in both English and Spanish, um, described 43 patients that had headaches with functional symptoms that occurred during the migraine. Um, they had 12 cases that they found in a retrospective review in 2003, and then between 2003 and 2012, added an additional 31 cases and then published that. All of these patients were examined by two different neurologists and a psychiatrist, and all had functional symptoms on examination that predominantly occurred during the headache. 90% of the patients uh, had abnormal movements as part of their functional symptoms. About 37% of the patients had both non-epileptic seizures and migraines, and a third of the patients had speech disorders, which is important because we see this frequently in our clinic. The time course of the functional symptoms in relationship to the headache varied in their patient population. Um, they may, in patients, uh, they found that they could occur before or during the headache. Um, functional symptoms in their patient population may persist longer than the headache, which is something we've seen in our clinic as well. Um, so how are we, how do we take care of these people? Well, this is really complicated and uh, I don't know that I've got the best system for this, but uh, more recently discussing these things as a functional system or a, a functional disorder as a disconnection between what their brain is telling them to do and what their muscles actually do has been better accepted than trying to discuss this as a psychiatric disorder or a stress-related problem. Um, in this case series that was published in uh, 2012, um, a third of the patients appeared to be completely normal psychologically by the, for the psychiatrists. One of the things that's been really helpful in discussing this with patients is when I 
am able to observe uh, fluctuating weakness or variation during examination, being able to tell the patient that, oh, look, during your exam, there were times that you were much stronger than you were during other times, and I think you're actually stronger than you really think you are, um, has been a, really a, a helpful way to discuss this with patients. Um, discussing this as an alteration in their brain's ability to integrate motor and sensory function has also been helpful for uh, some of our patients and at least opening the discussion without making them feel like we just think they're crazy. Coexisting psychiatric disease is very common in people with functional disorders, especially PTSD. Um, for motor functional disorders, we really strongly recommend working with a physical therapist. And not only does it give them a reason to get better, but it gives them a, a way to demonstrate to themselves that they're actually stronger than they think and than they think and that their function can be normal. Um, cognitive be behavioral therapy can be helpful with non-epileptic seizures as well. Um, uh, there's a number of other coexisting problems with functional disorder. Pain is really common in these patients. Um, uh, so that need, may need to be addressed uh, separately. Um, obviously, functional disorders appear to be more common in tertiary care centers, but the prevalence of migraine uh, and functional disorders as a combination is really uh, not clear. Uh, no one's ever looked specifically at specialty clinics in terms of how many of our patients have uh, functional disorders. Uh, there's a really nice website uh, by a couple of authors that have been writing uh, frequently on functional disorders uh, called neurosymptoms.org. Uh, this is really aimed at patients as a way for them to understand their functional symptoms, and it's been helpful for several of my patients in terms of them being able to look and say, oh yeah, I've got this symptom too, and it fits with what everybody else fits with their functional symptoms uh, in a very kind of uh, non-negative way to look at their symptoms. So that's an overview of functional symptoms and migraine, and now I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Singoka. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about something that is a continuation of Dr. Collins's talk. And uh, we're gonna talk about quantifying the number of headache patients with functional symptoms at Duke University. And I'm just gonna preface this with the fact that this is a preliminary study. Uh, there are no disclosures to report, and this is an IRB approved study. So uh, to our knowledge, there is little uh, published data about evaluating the co-concurrence of migraine and functional symptoms. In addition, the one study that Dr. Collins mentioned, uh, published in 2010, found that about 10% of 3,700 patients that were referred to a general neurology clinic had functional or uh, physiologic diagnosis. However, the incidence of patients with functional symptoms at a tertiary headache uh, center has not been reported. And informal discussions between providers at the Duke Headache Clinic suggest that the incidence may actually be high than the general population, but the exact frequency of this is unclear. And so uh, we pose this question, uh, what number of our Duke Headache Clinic patients have comorbid functional diagnosis? So based on this, we did a brief two week retrospective review to see if this holds true. Um, our study is a limited small a sample size, it's small, so it may not be exactly representative of our patient population. However, this gives us an understanding if further larger scale studies would be feasible. So uh, our primary objective was what number of patients have functional disorders that present uh, to our clinic. And the secondary endpoint was uh, what demographic headache characteristics and history differ between patients with functional versus non-functional disorder. Our inclusion criteria uh, they have to be Duke Medicine headache patients uh, seen by Dr. Collins or myself 
age over or equal to 18 and seen within this two week span, June 1st to June 14th, 2020. And the exclusion criteria is they have to have, they have, to have a headache condition. So if they didn't have one, they were excluded. So the patients were selected using did use a database and they were entered into REDCap and analyzed with REDCap and Excel function. Uh, this is a descriptive uh, preliminary study. So uh, we won't be mentioning p-values, but you know, that's a consideration when we have a larger study. Uh, and we're doing a very simplified study because our main objective is to quantify the number of patients that are functional. So uh, we have 11 variables that we evaluated for uh, age, uh, gender, uh, headache types, uh, functional symptoms present, if present, then what types, uh, history of stroke, history of TIA, history of seizure, a history of fibromyalgia, history of psychiatric disorder, and if present, what diagnosis, and if they were actively following with psychiatry or psychology, and then also the number of neurology providers seen other than Duke headache providers. Uh, we had uh, had some issues, particularly with the last two variables, because um, sometimes, uh, you know, doc, people, uh, we won't, uh, there's not enough documentation if they are actively seeing psychiatry or psychology. And also, uh, say they saw they were seen at the sleep clinic um, and they saw multiple providers in the sleep clinic. Uh, you know, do you count that as one provider or do you count that as multiple? So, uh, so in our, uh, so between that two week span, we found we had a total of exactly 150 patients. And of those, 144 had a diagnosis of, had a headache diagnosis. Um, this is explained because we do see some chronic pain patients and we rarely will get patients to our clinic with no head pain as their concern. Uh, the average age of our population in this two week span was 50 years of age and the range was uh, 20 minimum, 86 maximum. And the gender, 27% um, male and 72% female. And that's kind of uh, interesting because that ratio is approximately the ratio of, uh, of the um, prevalence or the, the population prevalence of um, migraine, like uh, female to male ratio three to one. But we do, but this also includes other headache types besides migraine. Uh, we didn't include race, but that would be an interesting factor uh, because are we overrepresenting certain races? And we would anticipate that if we, uh, include race in larger population, a study, um, we can use it to compare it to the local demographics and our health system as a whole. Uh, Dr. Collins, he, uh, had, you know, some of the studies he had mentioned, um, they mainly look into a homogeneous cultural background, the patients that were studied in these functional studies. So uh, this is the distribution of the headache features um, in um, all 144 patients. So as you can see, migraine um, being the most common, 71%. And of migraine, uh, chronic migraine without aura was the most common, 70%. Um, one thing to keep uh, aware of is um, some patients might have uh, multiple headache types. So they might have migraine and they might have IIH. So that would affect the interpretation of this. And this makes sense because um, most people that we see at the headache clinic, they've seen multiple providers uh, and typically they have more chronic or intractable headaches. Um, and um, we see more migraine than we see anything else. So in our patient population of 144, 17 or 11.8% had functional symptoms and 88.2% or 127 did not have functional symptoms. Um, and this is similar to other studies that quote 12%, but not as high as a study that was published in 2010 that quoted 15%. And uh, this is a distribution of the functional sy symptom types. And you can see that the most uh, uh, recorded was other, and non-epileptiform um, uh, seizures or events. Um, in terms of other, uh, 
it was a category where if it didn't quite fit any of these, we grouped it in this category. And on your right, there's a list of what we uh, considered other functional symptom types, including psychogenic leg pain, uh, functional GI issues, baby talk, uh, paresthesias that were determined to be non-functional in nature, a uh, patch of numbness over posterior head, dysesthesias of fingers and feet with negative EMG and skin biopsy, uh, fuzzy thinking lasting less than one minute, and episodes of leg abducting and adducting that were not directly observed or captured on EEG. Uh, so the certainty of diagnosis, uh, mostly we were more uncertain than certain about these diagnoses. And that could be related to the fact that sometimes we have sparse documentation or complete workup was not done. So we don't know definitively if this was functional or not. Um, sometimes they had transient spells that weren't directly observed or captured um, um, or, you know, uh, concern for like a, a false positive, a false negative. So we do know like, for instance, with skin biopsies, if you don't capture the right area, you could get a false, um, a false negative. And um, this is all 144 headache patients um, that we observed and with, uh, with and without functional symptoms. And um, uh, there is, uh, you know, 50% uh, have psychiatric comorbidities and 43% don't. And this does reflect our clinical experience um, with our headache patients. Uh, and from that 144, we grouped it into two groups. So the 17 with functional neurologic symptoms on your left, and on the right is the 127 that don't have, don't have uh, functional neurologic symptoms. And as you can see, um, the age is uh, pretty similar uh, in terms of the average age, which is 53 and 50. Um, 28 to 67 was the range and 20 to 59 um, in the patients without functional symptoms. So pretty similar between the two groups. The gender um, percentages were also similar between the two groups. Uh, there was a little bit higher percent of those with migraine uh, in the functional group than those without the functional symptoms. But I don't know if you could directly extrapolate that to the population just because this was a small sample size. Um, fibromyalgia and psychiatric diagnosis, they were um, you know, significantly higher in the functional neurologic group than the, those without functional um, neurologic symptoms. So 41%, 8% for fibromyalgia and 70% uh, in terms of psychiatric diagnosis for functional neurologic symptoms and 51% in those without. So the, these are the psychiatric comorbidities um, uh, in the, our 17 functional uh, patients with functional symptoms. And you can see that anxiety and depression are the most common. Um, and, you know, we see that in our, in our patient population as well. And a few had PT. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and a few patients had a history of childhood or sexual abuse. Uh, and uh, so we also even, we also compare the psychiatric comorbidities between the functional and those without functional um, symptoms. And the, uh, in both groups, uh, th so this is the number, this is not a percent, um, but there is a higher number of those with depression and anxiety in both of those groups. So uh, in conclusion, um, of our 150 patients seen within two weeks span, 144 reported to have headaches. And of those 11% or 17 had functional symptoms, 88% or 127, um, did not, and this was less than what we expected. Um, of the functional symptoms, non-epileptiform or other were the most common. And in most cases, we were not certain about our diagnosis, either because the episodes were transient and uh, uh, we couldn't fully evaluate the patient during the episode. Um, another factor I wonder is if we're not documenting completely because of the stigma associated with it and uh, if, you know, the patient response to that diagnosis, um, uh, you know, sometimes we'll kind of word it in a different way. 
Um, in patients with functional symptoms, um, we found that migraines slightly, fibromyalgia, and psychiatric conditions were reported um, at a higher rate. Uh, and overall, I, I do believe that we're um, underdocumenting our patients with functional conditions. And I think that's important because um, that helps us manage our patients um, uh, better. And, uh, you know, this is a uh, kind of a preliminary study, and we're open to any suggestions that if anyone has any. And I'd like to thank the people at the headache clinic and um, Dr. Collins, Coleman, our previous headache fellow, uh, Michael Lutz, and Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Sveta and Tim. Um, anyone with a question, just uh, put your name in, or the question in the chat, and we'll call on you. And uh, just say, is it to Tim or to Sveta? So Sveta, in, in dementia clinic, you might not believe it, but a lot of our patients complain of headaches and it's hard to say it's functional, but yeah. we also don't know how real it is. What, what might you call that or how do you think about that? Yeah, we actually talked about this in the past. Um, we have some patients that we don't, so one, one theory is like, it is their manifestation of their memory law their memory issues that they're saying that their head hurts, but their head doesn't really hurt, but it's, it's kind of them saying that there's something going on with their head, with their memory. Um, uh, the other is, I wonder if it's kind of like, sometimes if it's a little bit of like a perseveration, um, cause I, I do have one patient where she had uh, like a urinary urgency, um, despite no need to urinate. And in addition, she would repeatedly um, mentioned she has a headache. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question because I do, you know, you know, we do have uh, memory uh, patients with uh, memory issues and they do have headaches, but the question is how do we quantify that, you know, and how do we evaluate that? And I don't, I haven't quite figured out a good way of doing that. I think Sweta explained some of the, the problems with that. The, the biggest difficulty with those patients is that they're completely unable to describe what they mean when they say their head hurts. And they put their hand on their forehead and say, oh, my head hurts. And then when you ask them, well, what does it feel like? They have no descriptors that they can give you. And they also appear to be behaviorally in no distress. And then when none of our treatments make any difference, we really have to wonder what's going on there. And as Shweta said, we don't know if they actually have pain or if they're in some sort of distress, and that's the only descriptor they can use for it. Um, uh, Jody, do you want to ask your question? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if there's any evidence that uh, outcomes for these folks with functional uh, disorders are uh, better in a multidisciplinary clinic. And I know there's not a lot of them, but I wonder if there's any data about that. Well, I haven't seen any good data suggesting that that's better. And in fact, one of the debates that's ongoing in the literature regarding functional disorders um, is that whether or not neurologists should actually be involved with actual treatment of these patients or whether or not our role should stay only in diagnosing and explaining and limiting expensive testing uh, in these disorders. Um, I think we need to be involved because it's, you know, it's, you know, if it's not, if the psychiatrists aren't going to take care of this, which I, I have to say, my experience is that the vast majority of psychiatrists have no training or experience with functional disorders. So I think we kind of need to be involved. Uh, but I've not really seen any data suggesting that their outcomes are better in a multidisciplinary clinic. So there's a really good point raised by Carolyn Pizzoli. Uh, she says she wants to know what both you think about how patient notes being immediately available to patients is going to affect the honesty of physicians in describing functional disorders? And are there going to be code words used? Well, I think functional disorders is a really great thing to write in a medical record because it says what it is. This is a disorder of functioning of their legs or their arm or whatever. And I, I get, and I don't know what Dr. Sengupta's experience with her patients have been, but in my patient population, 
calling it a functional disorder isn't pejorative. They don't perceive that as calling them crazy like conversion disorder would or certainly hysteria would. I think it's better accepted, um, to be honest. Sveta, you want to comment on that? Uh, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, if, uh, I mean, if we we make a point to like write functional disorder, then I think, I, I don't think the patients interpret that as negatively as some other, you know, titles for this. Uh, keep the questions coming. What about my own pet peeve, which is tension headache? Nobody knows what that is. Is that a function? I mean, is that migraines? Everyone knows what migraines are. There's a biology behind it in the theory. Tension headache is a name that seems to belie its actual physiology. Well, that is true. And when you do population-based prevalence studies, tension headache is significantly more common in the population. If you ask the question, have you had a headache like this and describe a tension headache, uh, 60, 70% of people will say yes, but whether or not that represents a functional disorder or unexplained physiology, I, I don't know. Uh, you know. If you use the International Classification of Headache Disorders criteria for diagnosing tension headache, you get a unique patient population. And if you exclude you know, 10 or 15% of patients that have coexisting functional symptoms, you know, I think you may have, there may be something there, but uh, we frequently see people, I should say the few people we see in clinic with tension headaches, there are almost other, always some other psychologic issue at play. So I don't think that's been fully answered yet. Sveta, you want to comment? Yeah, uh, tension type headaches is kind of misnamed. Um, so, you know, um, we know it's not just like muscle tension, like uh, that's contributing to this headache. So it, it could be like down the road, they might decide to change the name of it. It just, um, you know, hasn't happened yet. What might they change it to? Yeah, that's the question I, I <laughs> wouldn't know. <laughs> not migraine. Not migraine. <laughs> All right, uh, Carmen, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think this was an excellent talk. I, I guess one of my pet peeves is that I think if a person is complaining of a headache or a back pain or any subjective symptom, it's real. So to say, is it real? I think it's not the point because they're experiencing real. 100% agree with you. I think to me, the question is, you know, why are they experiencing this? And as soon as the term subjective comes up or the term functional comes up, I think we immediately go, okay, well, then that's, quote, crazy, and that's somebody else's problem. And these people bounce and bounce and bounce, and then they become narcotic addicts. So well, I would say, do you have a psychiatrist on board that consistently also works with these people? Well, so the thing is, is the psychiatrist isn't particularly helpful for the patient to deal with their functional symptoms. And I think the point of changing the name from conversion disorder to functional symptoms is it puts the focus on function and the patient's complaint about their function and gives us something that we can actually work on. I mean, we're, we're, this, is, this is not an attempt to say that their symptoms aren't real. I mean, non-epileptic seizures are just as real as regular seizures. The underlying etiology is different, but the disability is the same. And you know, I have people with functional hemiparesis that their disability is as much as someone with a stroke, uh, but they don't have a stroke. They have a functional problem. And so this is not an attempt to say, oh, this is just crazy, go away. This is an attempt to give the patients a diagnosis that helps us understand what's going on and then helps us focus our treatment uh, on their particular problem, like sending them for cognitive behavioral therapy is much more productive than sending them for just general psychiatry intervention. Uh, so we're not- More really Botox. Yeah, and uh, also, oh, sorry. And I also think with these uh, patients with the diagnosis of functional symptoms, uh, I think it's important to continue to follow them because uh, something may uh, develop in the future if they do have new neurologic concerns. It doesn't mean that you do not pay attention to them. It, it means that you have to pay more attention to them because people are overlooking them. So I think that kind of awareness that, yeah, 
maybe some of their symptoms are functional, but not all of their symptoms. Um, it could be some other organic etiology is to keep, you know, uh, it, it essentially don't, uh, don't use that diagnosis and um, think that all of their symptoms are functional in, in nature. Yeah, and I, 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 I emphasize, I never once heard anybody say the word crazy. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that the long-term follow-up is really important. I, I have a number of patients that I've been following for 10 years or more that have clear functional symptoms. And the long-term follow-up is really helpful because when they come in with what they say is a new patient, I'm, in particular, I'm thinking of a patient that I saw uh, this week with tremor. But while I looked back through the record, we talked about this last year. But the patient's symptoms got better, and I don't know if they're functional or not yet, but the patient's symptoms got better, and then they came back. And I have other patients that have clear functional symptoms, and they have some symptoms at some times and other symptoms at others, but the fact that I've been seeing them for years lets me look back and say, oh yeah, you had the same problem back then exactly like you have now, and it both reassures the patient that this has happened before and that we've looked at this problem before and evaluated it and not found any serious problem. So in the same way that, you know, patients with non-epileptic seizures don't need an EEG and a, uh, an ER trip every time they have a spell, you know, some of our other functional symptoms, the fact that we can say, oh yeah, we, we've talked about this or, oh, you know, we see this in other patients like the, the language problems in headache patients. Uh, helps them understand that, well, yeah, this happens, it's normal in some people, and it's not a sign of a new disease. So it, I think the long-term follow-up of these patients from a support standpoint can be very helpful, and it doesn't need to be particularly frequent. You know, once every three or four months or you know, twice a year for some patients is sufficient. So uh, just to wrap up, um, Snea pointed out a good website with helpful tips for dealing with functional disorders. It's called neurosymptoms.org. And then uh, Katie Peters had one last question for Sveta. And it's Sveta, can you comment on the role of the family of the patient or the caregiver in treating uh, or understanding functional disorders? Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that question. Um, do you have an a, a answer for that, Dr. Collins? Well, I, I think they're actually critical to yeah. uh, treating and supporting these patients because when they come in with caregivers, which some of our more severely involved patients always come with a caregiver, but if they come in with a caregiver and you can get the, their caregiver to understand that yeah, this looks really bad, but it's been going on and we've evaluated it and there's no sign of something serious. And as long as it's the same thing every time, they don't need to you know, panic and call the emergency room or take the patient to the hospital um, if it looks like it always has. And that tends to help significantly on the family side because you know, when our patient has a headache and then has you know functional language problems, they can treat their headache, they can you know give them the rescue medications and have help them into bed, which is what they need, without going to the emergency room every single time and having a big stroke workup. You know, we have uh, we've had a number of patients over the years that have had you know 10 or more CT scans as part of a stroke workup every time they have functional symptoms. And getting a family involved with that uh, is I think really critical. I, I think uh, mostly when they come in with a caregiver, the caregiver is very supportive. Um, that's what I've noticed. Um, uh, you know, if say you're, you know, if you break a new diagnosis to a, a family, um, yeah, sometimes they may not, the, the caregiver may not be happy about that diagnosis too. Um, and uh, the patient themselves may be okay with it, but the caregiver, you know, isn't. Um, but in general, like I've, most of the caregivers that we've like encountered, they're, they're very helpful and, and they, it helps them understand what's happening too. Uh, thank you both, Sveta. I came up with a good name for tension headaches. How about non-migrainous headache? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, but then the, you know, the other headache types, like trigem, like other. Yeah, but none of us, none of us see those or figure <laughs> them out. Migraine or forget it. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you to Tim and Sveta and everyone else. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Thank you.